So today it's a, a, a double on uh, neuro ophthalmology. Um, so I'm going to just give a really brief um, update on idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and I'm going to highlight some controversies that along the way. Um, but I'm going to first start with a typical case of a 28-year-old woman who has uh, headaches. They're increasing, they're daily, and they're disabling. And she also has transient visual obscurations. She hears noises or whooshing noises in her head, and she has pain between her shoulder blades. She has good acuity, no afferent defect, her neurologic examination is normal, and her general examination is notable for her obesity. Her visual fields show enlarged blind spots and also some uh, nasal loss. And it, when you look in the back of her eye, she has bilateral papilledema. So um, you're thinking she's got some kind of intracranial hypertension. And the first point I want to make is that whenever we see one of these patients, well, you know, she's obese and she looks like she fits the stereotype, we want to be thinking about secondary causes of intracranial hypertension as well as primary causes. Today we're going to talk about primary causes, but it's really important to rule out venous sinus obstruction, look at medical conditions, and consider medications that she could be on, like the tetracyclines, minocycline, uh, Norplant, and so forth. But she had a normal MRI scan, except that uh, there are a few findings, and I tell the residents to always look for dilated optic nerve sheaths on the MRI scan. You may even see the papilla bulging into the globe. Uh, you also want to look at a sagittal view because an empty cella is frequently seen. And with mo many of these cases, we're getting um, uh, venograms, uh, MR venograms, which can be done exactly at the same time as the MRI. And one of the findings that is seen sometimes in the venogram is some irregularity of the transverse sinuses. And some people feel like that narrowing of the transverse sinus can actually be a sign of increased intracranial pressure. Uh, you can't stop just with a scan. You have to go on and get a lumbar puncture. And her opening pressure was 350, and she had normal protein glucose in cells. So the, this woman meets the criteria for idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Her symptoms are only those of increased intracranial pressure. Her signs are only those of increased intracranial pressure. You can sometimes see a sixth nerve palsy, rarely a seventh nerve palsy. And sometimes you can see some trigeminal abnormalities. Um, y you have to have a documented elevated intracranial pressure, and this is really important. You have to ask, how was that pr pressure obtained? Was the person lying on their side with their legs outstretched or could have, have been falsely elevated? And that's going to be important when we talk about uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension without papilledema. The CSF must be normal. If it's not normal, then you've got some other process going on, and you really have to look carefully for other causes on imaging. Uh, for intracranial hypertension. So what is IIH? And uh, as you know, this uh, disorder has undergone a metamorphosis in, of terms. It used to be called meningitis serosa, then it was pseudotumor cerebri, and then it was benign intracranial hypertension. And we're settling on, at the moment, idiopathic intracranial hypertension or primary intracranial hypertension. It really is a disorder of women, uh, six to one, uh, no question about it. Um, about 90% of the people who have this have headaches. About 50% have some kind of visual disturbance or auditory disturbance. And if you ask about whooshing, the, the, and if you really ask the question, that percentage will go up. Uh, papilledema is almost universal, although there are some cases that don't have papilledema, and it's usually associated with obesity. Now, you have to ask yourself, what's at stake here, and why do you even care, care about it? Well, the first point is that there's visual loss. And um, while acuity is not lost and blindness is not common, visual field loss is uh, actually present in at least a third of the patients. And about a quarter, uh, when Dr. Corbett went through all of his cases over 20 years, had permanent severe visual field loss. Um, and despite all of our treatments, uh, at, you know, even modern day treatments, 14 to 35 percent of people will have visual function or visual field loss. The second thing is it's a chronic condition. 
At Iowa, they took, uh, they reviewed 410 patients. They had 20 people followed for more than 10 years, and nine, about half of them, worsened after being stable. So people can be tootling along and be doing really, really well, and then all of a sudden they start having headaches and visual loss, and then they're uh, have, having the condition back again. And their quality of life is definitely uh, diminished. Uh, Julia, uh, uh, published in Neurology about 10 years ago, a wonderful article about, and was the first article to show that the quality of life in this condition is very low. And recently, three years ago, the Penn group uh, published this study, which was actually exactly what we found. They just used some different methods, but showed that the physical quality of life, uh, emotional, so depression, anxiety are higher in this group, and their visual uh, quality of life is also lower. So this is an important condition because it affects people's vision, but it also affects their quality of life. Now I did want to mention a couple new things along the way. One of these is men. Men do get IIH, it's not as common. And this recent paper by Bo Bruce uh, showed that uh, many of the men may have testosterone deficiency, and I think this is a really big one. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea is more common in men. So if you see a man with IIH, you should be thinking obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, they also they use two uh, questionnaires uh, to determine that the, that people with um, IIH and men had a greater uh, incidence of obstructive sleep apnea and also a higher ratio of uh, androgen abnormalities on a questionnaire. Now, there are many controversies. I mean, we could spend an hour just talking about the nomenclature of this disorder. We could talk about imaging um, controversies. But I'm going to highlight basically three. One, I'm going to ask the question, can there be idiopathic intracranial hypertension without papilledema? And I know that there have been more than one patient coming from triage with this question. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about obesity and the treatment of obesity and a study that we're going to be doing, well, we are doing, and then talk a little bit about endovascular treatment, which is a pretty hot topic. So let's take that same person that I introduced you to at the beginning of this talk. And she's obese, she has headaches, she has whooshing noises in her head, her MRI scan is normal, except she's got a little dilated nurse sheet. She's got a partially empty cella. She looks exactly like that person, only you look in and you see this. She doesn't have any papilledema, okay, neither I. But her lumbar puncture shows an opening pressure, properly done, uh, of 30, 300 millimeters of CSF. So does this woman have IIH? So the first question you have to ask yourself is, can you have high intracranial pressure without papilledema? And there's some lines of evidence here that um, I think are pretty clear. First, if you take all people with brain tumors and ask the question, how many of those people get papilledema? They've got space-occupying lesions, they've got high intracranial pressure, not all of them get papilledema, probably less than half, okay? Uh, trauma, uh, Jack Selhorst in 1985 uh, uh, sat in an intensive care unit um, in a busy city hospital looking at everybody's fundus who had had a bad head trauma. And he followed them through their stay in the ICU, monitoring their intracranial pressure with bolt monitoring, and went to look to see if they developed papilledema. And he followed them for days out. And, uh, and he found that about half or less developed papilledema even though he was looking every single day. And these people had documented high intracranial pressure. And then I think the another really good line of evidence is uh, we all often see people with asymmetric papilledema. So here's the same person, and on one side, m maybe you could make out grade one papilledema, but on the other side, you've got grade four with obscuration of all the vessels, 360 degrees. You've got two different grades of papilledema in the same individual with the same high pressure. So this has led people to believe that the pressure is transduced along the optic nerve in the dural space and that some people's anatomy may not allow for people to have pressure uh, going, you know, uh, developing behind the globe and giving uh, axoplasmic stasis, which is what papilledema is, axoplasmic stasis. So the qu answer to this question is yes, there can be high pressure without papilledema. 
Now, the, 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 the um, waters became muddied when the headache folks got involved here. And um, over the last 15 years or so, they've been doing lumbar punctures on people with chronic refractory headaches, okay? And um, in one center, they found 15% of people with chronic daily headaches, they just all comers did lumbar punctures, <coughs> and they had pressures up to 450. Now, this study was always criticized because they said, oh, you'd never had a neuro-ophthalmologist looking, you were just, look, you know, just looking at an undilated pupil, maybe all these people were yeah. rebound. And so uh, a second study was recently published of 60 people with chronic migraine, and 10% of these people had increased intracranial pressure, and uh, all of them had BMIs of uh, greater than 25. And their conclusion was that in patients with BMIs over 30, you should at least consider uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension if people have a, high, uh, have a lot of chronic uh, migraine. So we did a study that we published um, last year. Um, uh, we took all of our patients with IIH, um, and we, chose, we, we found 20 people who met the criteria of IIH without papilledema, and we matched them to 20 people with papilledema, and all these people were examined by a neuro-ophthalmologist. All of them had opening pressures done by uh, Judith or by a neurologist that we trusted. Uh, and here's what we found. Uh, when we compared, I mean, uh, most of these people were women, obviously. Most of them were obese. The um, uh, BMI on this group was a mean, mean of 35. They were almost identical. The two differences were the people without papilledema had a slightly lower intracranial pressure uh, mean of 309 versus 373. We didn't pick anybody that wasn't... Uh, um, uh, it had to be higher than 250 millimeters of CSF. The other thing was that these people had more lumbar punctures, uh, many of them because nobody believed that that's really what they had, was that they had intracranial hypertension. Uh, they both had uh, migraines, they both had depression, and we couldn't find any differences in their symptoms. They all had headaches, visual obscurations, maybe the IIH with papilledema had a few more visual obscurations. Uh, they had the same pulsatile tinnitus, uh, even a few with diplopia. And their headaches were very similar. You really couldn't tell much difference between them. The ones without papilledema maybe had more auras, but um, otherwise they were very, very comparable. Their acuities uh, were by and large very good. Uh, the ones without papilledema did a little bit better. The ones with papilledema had a little fewer, uh, some of them have decreased acuity. And the visual fields were interesting. So the ones without papilledema, as you would expect, had a normal visual field without an enlarged blind spot, and the ones with papilledema had enlarged blind spot. But here's what we didn't expect. We didn't expect uh, this large number of the ones without papilledema to have functional visual loss. So these were people who came in with constricted fields, no papilledema, and at the tangent screen, you know, the one meter, the, the visual field did not expand from one meter to three meters. So they had functional visual loss. And this has actually been um, shown also in a large study of IIH where they found about a 6%, at least a 6% rate of functional visual fields in a large series of, of um, people with IIH. So one take-home message for us is always to be careful that the visual field is not functionally constricted in this group of individuals. So, you know, um, we know that this is a chronic disorder. Uh, Dr. Corbett went and retapped patients 20 years later and found that um, uh, people tended to have high intracranial pressure despite no papilledema years uh, after the diagnosis was made. Uh, Annette Kessler in Israel uh, has targeted the recurrence rate to be at least 38%. The problem with recurrence is you don't know when it ends. Uh, many of the patients I follow have it for years and years, and if I take them off their Diamox, their headaches are back, their symptoms are back, their papilledema gets worse. So it's like it's a chronic condition. And this was uh, corroborated also by um, others who have looked at this as well. And you have to ask yourself, how many of these patients continue to have increased intracranial pressure without papilledema, and, and the answer is not, has not really been determined yet. 
So I think um, the IIH without papilledema uh, exists. It's probably not common. I don't think it's as common as 10% of every chronic daily headache patient. I see headaches all the time, and it's not 10% of my practice uh, in a headache clinic. But I think it's difficult to diagnose, and I think there's some caveats. We have to be sure that they have truly elevated intracranial pressure, that, that the pressure was measured uh, properly, that the person wasn't valsalving, they weren't hypoventilating. Um, you, I think you do have to look, you can look at the MRI scan to help you with these cases. I especially like to look for empty cella, narrowing of the transverse sinuses. And then I think we have to watch for constricted fields because they can have functional visual loss. And then I think this point really hasn't been made enough that this really is a chronic condition and that people can have this condition for years. And while some people can have a self-limited one-time event, there's a whole group of these people that have it for a long period of time. So going from IIH without papilledema to why does this occur, um, there's some work do being done about the genetics of this disorder. Uh, Judith has given a very nice grand rounds about vitamin E in this disorder. I'm just going to touch on obesity. So I just want you to watch the uh, browning of America, the fattening of America. This is in 2000. 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we, in 10 years, in 20 years, have really gone from a fairly lean country to a fairly, I mean, we're, um, you know, over, ha over half the country is o o greater than 25 to 30 percent obese. This is really an epidemic. So does obesity have anything to do with IIH? Well, f first of all, the first line of evidence is that 90% of the people who have it are obese. Case control studies show that that's one of the factors that separates out uh, people with this disorder. And if you can lose weight, uh, you can go into remission. Um, and of course, obesity has numerous complications. We've already brought up sleep apnea, but there's insulin resistance and um, other comorbidities with obesity like polycystic ovarian disease that can make this uh, diagnosis and this condition very difficult for these individuals. It is really clear that the incidence and prevalence increases as uh, you look at obesity. So if you take a normal weight population, the incidence is about 3.5 per 100,000. Uh, as soon as you get overweight individuals, it goes up, and when you have obese individuals, it's 20, 20 per 100,000. That's the same incidence as multiple sclerosis. Uh, so it's very common, you know, and we, it's pretty common in obesity. Uh, moderate weight gain seems to precipitate this, and Annette Kessler has pointed out, this was, I think, in ophthalmology just this year, that the patients who have IIH tend to have the pear shaped body or the lower fat body as opposed to the apple or mid shape, the one you see often with metabolic syndrome. Um, and th so there's some rationale for uh, people having obesity causing or being related to increased intracranial pressure. One is some people believe that the abdominal adiposity affects the central venous pressure. And, there, and it is true that some individuals do have increased central venous pressure. And we do know that venous hypertension will lead to increased intracranial pressure. And then there's a group that thinks that the inflammatory markers that come with obesity are associated with um, setting up IIH. Now, the first question you have to ask is, does IIH increase um, uh, the pressure in the brain by itself? And James Corbett did a study where he showed that there was maybe a little bit of elevation of pressure, and so that's when we started adopting pressures have to be greater than 250 in obese uh, people. Um, so this study, which was done um, in Australia and England, showed kind of a normal distribution of CSF pressures, but these were normal people without papilledema, and even in normal people, you can see that uh, there can be people, normals, with increased pressure. Then they stratified those people from underweight and normal, and while there was a trend for the overweight and obese per people to have a slightly increased uh, incidence of higher pressures, it was not statistically significant. So the normal pressure is, in this large study, between 10 and 25. Now, I don't know if you, you saw this study, but this came out of Penn 
just in the New England Journal this year, where they looked at children and asked, what's a normal pressure in children? And it was done at a children's hospital, people who were coming in for various reasons for lumbar punctures, um, and they excluded people with known high intracranial pressure. And look at the normal range in pressures. These were kids uh, with no papilledema going from, you know, 80 uh, millimeters to, you know, 450 millimeters. Whoops. And um, one thing that they found that is, I think, important is that uh, some there, w there were some things that caused pressures to be elevated, and one was sedation. So when kids are sedated, they hypoventilate a little bit and their pressures can be elevated. And so you really can't accept that high pressure in children if they've been sedated. Um, you really have to be careful about that or monitor it carefully. They also found a slight correlation with BMI. As the BMI went up, the opening pressures got a little bit higher, but it wasn't a one-to-one. -one. And the pressure really was all over the place uh, for all, all ages. So I think this is kind of cool that finally we have a study that actually shows what normal pressure is in children. Um, so how about obesity? Should we say that obesity is, is the cause of IIH? Well, I think first of all, we have to explain the non-obese cases. Not everybody's obese, you know. 10 to 20% of people are not obese. Um, and in children, 70% are not obese. Um, and in many centers across the world, um, very few people are obese with this condition. Um, so there's a lot of things that we really don't understand. Uh, Bo Bruce did a study this year that showed in all, if you take all the non-obese patients, uh, more of them are likely to have medication-related IIH. So in your non-obese patient, you better look a little bit more carefully for a secondary cause. I think the link is there, it's not fully understood, um, and as we see more obesity in our country, we're more likely to see IIH, and we probably really need to repeat some of the um, incidence and prevalence studies. Uh, for certainly, um, this is well proven that obesity is linked with headache chronification, meaning that people who have episodic headaches can develop chronic headaches without high pressure due to just to uh, having obesity. Now, what about uh, treatments? I'm going to spend a couple minutes now talking about uh, treatment. Um, there really are no double-blind masked controlled trials in this disorder. Uh, data is really case series. Uh, and our goals of treatment really should be to resolve the condition, prevent visual loss, treat the headache, improve quality of life, and then um, get people back to work. Because a lot of these people end up not um, being able to live their lives. Um, some people would argue you wouldn't even treat somebody who doesn't have symptoms or signs. There can be people who come into the clinic who have papilledema, diagnosed IIH, but have really no headaches, no visual loss, no nothing. You, you really could argue, do you really need to treat those people? Because it, you may not. Uh, for sure, you should at least think about depression because that's a higher incidence. Ask about sleep apnea using the Berlin questionnaire. And if they're overweight, you have to counsel them about weight loss. Because there have been many studies, uh, Len Johnson and, um, and Mark Cooper Smith have shown that just losing a modest amount of weight uh, can actually uh, bring about a remission. And the evidence for this really has been known for a long time. Uh, back in the 60s, Greer, who was a kind of a pseudotumor cerebri maven uh, when it was called benign intracranial hypertension, uh, advocated for weight loss. Then Newberg, she was a internist in the 70s, and she had a bunch of these patients and looked in the back of their eyes, some of them she took photographs of, put them on a rice diet, about a 600 calorie rice diet for several months, and she showed that they were able, in, in three months this person uh, lost their papilledema just by going on this rice diet. So this is the first evidence we had that diet actually uh, worked. Um, Dr. Sugarman in, in Virginia does bariatric surgery, and he was finding that his bariatric surgery uh, patients who underwent bariatric surgery for their IIH had a, a definite improvement uh, in their condition, and then Len Johnson and Mark Cooper Smith found the same. This summer, this study was, print, uh, uh, was published in the uh, British Medical Journal, uh, and this was 25 women with IIH 
They followed the women for three months and got a baseline on their headaches, on visual uh, situation, et cetera. They put them on a 425 calorie diet for three months. Can you believe anybody could stay on a 425 calorie diet for three months? That was the most amazing part of this whole study. Uh, and then they followed them up after the diet. But this is really incredible. I mean, 425 calories. So they lost weight. Guess what? They did lose weight. So their, their, uh, their weights definitely declined. Here they are at the beginning. Uh, and then they went on this diet. And then they kept the weight off. So all of them lost weight. And their intracranial pressure um, went down, which was really remarkable. Uh, on average, about 80 uh, millimeters or 8 centimeters. Um, and their headaches got better. Uh, their papilledema improved, but only four developed completely normal uh, intracranial pressure at, at the end of the study. So this is the really the first study where they used a case, their se themselves as a case controlled, but it's the first really prospective cohort study that's ever been done in this condition, showing that weight loss really does improve the headaches, it improves the uh, intracranial pressure, it improves papilledema, et cetera. So we're embarking because um, in the Cochrane review, there's no adequate therapy, no evidence for any adequate therapy. We are embarking on the idiopathic intracranial hypertension trial, IH, uh, IIHTT, and it's a randomized trial on for, with mild visual loss, and it's comparing diet alone versus diet plus acetazolamide. Um, and the hypothesis is that acetazolamide plus <coughs> diet would be superior to diet alone in restoring vision to in people with mild visual loss. But at the same time, we're looking at genetic factors, proteomic, genomic factors. We're looking at metabolism factors and vitamin A in the serum and CSF in these individuals. Uh, we're one of 39 sites across the country. As you can see, most of them are on the East Coast. So we're holding up the West Coast and Intermountain area. Um, and uh, this study is just underway. We've, we've enrolled uh, two people into the study, and um, it's just kind of gaining momentum at right now. Well, aside from weight loss, what else can you do with these folks? Uh, cetazolamide has been used for, you know, 30, 40 years, um, and it's not an easy drug to use because it's got a lot of side effects, but, it, but in, for many of us, we feel like it's pretty effective, and the biggest problem is using the correct dose. Most people need at least one gram uh, even children need a higher dose uh, than what they're often given. If they can't tolerate acetazolamide, we've used, also used methazolamide, which has fewer side effects, and sometimes Lasix or furosemide can be used. Um, then there are other medical therapies. Topiramate, which is an anticonvulsant approved by the FDA for migraine, will also in, uh, decrease intracranial pressure a little bit because it has some carbonic anhydrase inhibition, and in one study was as helpful as acetazolamide. So if you have somebody with a lot of headaches but not so much visual loss, topamax might, or topiramate might be a good choice of medications. Um, some people think steroids are indicated in this disorder. The problem with steroids is as you withdraw them, there's all kinds of uh, rebound in intracranial pressure. So most people kind of avoid the steroids because there's weight gain and you get diabetes and everything else. So we probably don't use it. For a while, there was some interest in these cardiac glycosa, uh, uh, glycosides like digoxin, but that's gone out of the favor. Octreotide does work, but it costs a million dollars to put somebody on this, so you don't want to do that. And some people with polycystic ovarian syndrome have had benefit from metformin and, and diet. Uh, this is in women. Now, there are surgical treatments if people's uh, vision drops. Um, you may not think about lumbar puncture as a surgical treatment, but there are times when we use lumbar puncture to temporize the situation, get people out of this acute situation. If they're losing vision, get them in the hospital, put a drain in, get that fluid off of the nerve right away. You can do that quite quickly. We don't use subtemporal decompression. This was a, a procedure where they actually took the temporal bone off the brain and let the brain swell and the pressure. Well, you can imagine the unsightliness of that. So nobody really wants to do that. The two procedures that are most used are shunts, and they are the shunts are gaining some popularity, again, because there are adjustable valves where you can actually dial in your pressure of what you want. 
because some of the problems with these shunts were they'd overdrain, underdrain, and you could never get the pressure just right. So they're gaining popularity. Optic nursery fenestration, we still use that, and I'll show you some data that supports our use of that. And then um, gastric bypass. For some of these people, there's so many new procedures, lap band therapy, et cetera, that are pretty benign that really do help with weight loss and probably are more curative. And then the new kid on the block is venous stents. How many of you have heard of venous stents for IIH? Well, good. So you're going to learn something this morning. Um, so venous pressures, for years it's been known that if you increase your venous pressure, you will increase your intracranial pressure. There's, this is, you know, 1930s work, boom, direct correlation, okay? Um, and so um, about, you know, um, 15 years ago, um, John King in Australia noted that people with IIH had venous hypertension by measuring their venous pressures in their sagittal sinus transverse sinus. And um, if he uh, took the fluid off, so let's say he did a lumbar puncture after he measured the pressure, the venous pressure would dive down or drop. And, um, and so, he, so he and a bunch of, some of these guys, you know, in Australia, they, they'll try anything, and they did. And, uh, and they put a stent in these people with sinuses that look like this. And here's this beautiful open sinus. And they found, voila, the intracranial pressure went to normal. So they thought, well, who we got a new treatment for intracranial hypertension. And so they started doing this um, uh, dramatically uh, and have a large series, which I'll show you. Oh, these earpieces, eh? All right. Now, um, this, however, is just somebody who, I just want to show you kind of somebody who had a lumbar puncture who, who had a change in their venous sinus. So here they are at baseline. They have this kind of tight-looking vein, transverse sinus vein. Then they do a lumbar puncture, and that vein actually opens up. They do a second lumbar puncture and lower the pressure even more. It opens up more. And then after the lumbar puncture, uh, uh, they put in a shunt to keep the pressure down, and that vein stays open. So it's clear that getting rid of the spinal fluid also will open up the vein. So you can open up these veins by putting a stent in, or you can just lower the intracranial pressure and get those veins to open up in many cases, okay? So here's a case of the stent. And then the problem with these stents is, okay, you put it in, and here's one week later, the person's already getting a little stenosis right here and the pressure's going back. And you could, I mean, you can't put, keep putting stents in because you get into trouble. Well, the, I um, kind of tabulated all these stent cases, um, and Matt Thurtell reported 22 of these. He also f was from Australia. Almost, these are all Australia cases. Um, and you can see that um, they improved. Um, their papilledema mostly resolved. But there were complications. Uh, uh, many of them uh, had thrombosis. Uh, one person got a subdural hemorrhage, uh, restenosis. Uh, and now there's been one death in the Australia uh, series. Um, so it's not for everybody. Um, Steve Felden uh, from University of Rochester did a nice meta-analysis of what procedure is the best for vision in IIH. And he covered stent placement, VP shunts, LP shunts, optic nerve sheath fenestration, and um, in both acute and chronic cases. And you can see that 80% of people with the optic nerve sheath fenestration did better versus all of these other procedures. And, and granted, this is a meta-analysis, retrospective review of other people's outcomes, but at least it gives you some idea that probably optic nerve sheath fenestration for visual loss is probably still the procedure of choice. Safety, um, these stents are, have um, serious AEs in at least 20%, um, but, and um, death has been reported now. Um, and you can see that, you know, every procedure has serious adverse events. Uh, hopefully not death, um, but, but um, you can see that this can be a problem. And often reoperations. Now, bariatric surgery, there, you know, this is just from one series, but, um, you know, they, a lot of these people do get problems after the surgery, but they have very few reoperations or needing treatment. So stenting, I think, is not a first-line option until we understand what causes, in what cases can we have reversibility 
So if you take the spinal fluid off, that's a much safer treatment than putting a foreign object in somebody's vein that you can't ever retrieve. Um, and we really need to understand, you know, kind of the safety issues. And maybe there are cases where with people with fixed tight stenosis that don't go away with lumbar punctures that are keeping the pressure high, maybe this would be a treatment we can do. And for sure, we need uh, more controlled trials. I do want to alert you about this problem, fulminant IIH, because this is the one that gets ophthalmologists sued. It's the on only condition in neuro-ophthalmology where I've been, I've been asked multiple times to testify uh, is this fulminant IIH thing. These are people who come in, bad papilledema, and it's, the problem is delay in recognition. They've had headaches, and they've gone to the ER, and they went to their primary care, and they went to, and they went, finally, they get to an ophthalmologist who g finds that they have pa papilledema. You just have to you just have to jump on this. This is one of those emergencies that you just take on and say, I'm sitting with this patient till they get a nerve sheath fenestration. I've got their fluid under control. I might put a drain in at the same time to get the pressure done. But the problem with this is that even you do all this stuff, even give them two grams IV of acetazolamide to lower their pressure, IV methylprednisolone, they still end up blind. Um, and the only plea on this one is just early recognition. And so residents who are going out into practice, I'm just warning you that this is the one condition. You don't just say, hey, come back and see me in a couple months. If they've got field loss, you've got to jump on this one, okay? Because this is really a bad one. So IIH uh, is a perplexing condition. We really don't understand it. But, um, and it's probably more common because of our obesity epidemic. Uh, we definitely know there's a venous contribution that can't be ignored, but I don't think it should be stented. And I think this is chronic. There's a lot of people who have a chronic form of this disorder that have elevated pressure for years. I do want to tell you about the NAVO Library. Every chance I get, I uh, advertise this. Joint project with the University of Utah Eccles Health Sciences Library and the North American Neuro-Ophthalmology Society. And on this, por on this website, which is free to everybody in the world, uh, we have a patient portal, and you can go to the patient portal and get brochures for your patients on pseudotumor, many other conditions as well. Some of them are translated into Spanish, Hebrew, German, I can't remember all the languages, but there's like seven languages. Um, and uh, and uh, an up-to-date, this will take you to an up-to-date search for the recent five years in PubMed of IIH articles. There's a support group website. Um, and there's some other uh, tools. And then these are all uh, downloadable in large print format as well as regular print format uh, for your patients. Um, and so I've left about four minutes for questions here. We can maybe turn the lights on. <laughs> it's a whirlwind tour, yeah. Yeah. You know, I love venous pulsations. I love them. I study them. I adore them. I look for them. But no, you can't use them. Because there are cases with actual documented venous pulsations with an opening pressure of 500. <coughs> and a documented. Okay, so I mean, you can't use them completely. Now, it makes you feel warm and fuzzy when you see those little venous pulsations. There is, there is, you know, there, if you were going to take uh, people and say venous pulsations are present, how many of those have increased pressure? Probably very few of them would, okay? So you can still kind of use it, but it's not something you want to hang your hat on. If, if you've got somebody who's obese, chronic headache, no papilledema, but, but, but you don't know, and they've got whooshing in their ears, and maybe they've got pain between their shoulder blades, and maybe... You know, do you know what I mean? You don't know. You may have to do an intercranial, you have to do a lumbar puncture to know for sure. Even though I love that sign, you know. And there, there's some people who believe if you saw them and they went away, then maybe that's a better sign, but I, you really can't hang your hat on it. Yeah, Randy. So fascinating, uh, and, and it's obvious that, <coughs> as I reviewed what you're saying, there's a, whole, a lot more unanswered questions than answered questions. Yeah. But it sounds like this is another classic complex case of So uh, I think that, that to the extent
can't uh, appeal to the big ends of some of those things. I think there's a difference in the world. Well, for that's. Because I follow some of these. I've got some of these viewers. You're right. It's a chronic disease. Um, and they get put up with those symptoms of Dymon, or they quit because they want it, and then they get the other symptoms back. I mean, most of these people, are, they, they, once they have it, unless they can get a dramatic weight loss, they, 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 they just. They they just smolder and keep going on. And I, I agree with you 100%. That's what's, what's very exciting about the IIHTT trial, doing the proteomics, genomics, uh, doing vitamin A, because vitamin A has been associated with it, doing genetic studies. I think this is going to be very helpful and may open this up a little bit. But it is complex. I, I, don't, I think this is definitely a complex disorder. It's not a easy schmeasy, oh, yeah, it's just obesity, or it's just this, or it's just that. Yeah. Catherine, one of the questions that comes up when I talk to parents and kids that are apart from the bigger system things that we look for and headaches, are there other long term neurologic sequelae of having this? I've asked and answered a couple of times how parents and teenagers, and I've, I'm not really, you know, I'm talking to my teens and young college and college, I've not really gotten a real clear answer. I, I don't know of any long term sequela to the brain from high pressure. Okay, um, w you know, in our study and in the Penn study, uh, depression, you really have to look for depression because there I that really exists. And, and that's a brain disorder too, as you know. So, um, uh, so I really feel like um, that I, I'm alert for depression in these individuals, uh, but I'm n I don't know of any brain pathology that's long-term in any of these individuals. So it's not like they're going to have learning difficulties or anything else. I mean, they're going to have problems with headaches, and they've got to get those under control, which can interfere with their ability to go to school and things like that. So if they get things under control, they still have to get that Yeah, control. absolutely. Sure. And with kids, there's a kind of an end point with kids. I mean, I've followed kids that have it, and they kind of grow out of it, and they never have it again. I don't... You know what I mean? If if you can get them over that hump, you're 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 fi you're fine. It's the, 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 older, the older kids can be chronic, can but those little kids they really outgrow it pretty quickly. Yeah. How common are such nerve problems? It's very common. <coughs> yeah, it, that's common. You know, 10, tw 10 20 percent. So yeah, uh, six nerve palsy is common in this disorder. So diplopia is a common complaint. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, you can see a skew. Uh, complex diplopias have been uh, reported. I saw a kid with bilateral six, bilateral sevens, uh, and almost a total ophthalmoplegia. I mean, she could raise her eyes a little bit, and she had a little, t I mean, she, it was just dramatic. She got the lumbar puncture, and everything started moving again. It was really phenomenal. I've got a, that case I've got published in one of my articles. Yeah. You mentioned With, without? Um, well, I mean, th that's, it's not rare, you know. It, when they come in and they've had tetracycline, minocycline, I mean, those are not rare cases. Um, how many total? I'd, I'd have to look at our, our, you know, data, but I'd say, you know, 10, 20 percent. What would you say, jo Judith? I don't think that number is known. Of how many would be medication related? Do you mean the total population? Yeah. So if somebody comes in skinny, <coughs> go after them. And then you just have to kind of get your list out and say, okay, what have you been on? What have you been doing? And they often don't know that they're just vitamin A. They don't know. Well, you kind of have to say what, and if they take drinks, these drinks now, oh, my gosh, some of these drinks have like, oh, gee. You know, if you look at the ingredients on these energy drinks and vitamin drinks, oh, my goodness, it's like taking 20 mul multiple vitamins every day. Well, 
so you really can't, you really have to look at what they're doing. Yeah. What's the etiology of? Uh, acetazolamide. Okay, acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It's, it's right. It's a mild diuretic. It's not a heavy diuretic, but what it does is it keeps spinal fluid from being made in the brain, so it lowers it lowers the CSF production. Yeah, well, there's, you're right, uh, and some people wonder about that. That's why this study, IIHTT, there's a placebo, so they get acetazolamide or a placebo, okay? They get a placebo, so we'll know whether acetazolamide is doing anything. Everybody's getting weight loss, but the big thing is that it's either acetazolamide or a placebo. It, it does work. It does work to lower the pressure. But obesity is probably one mechanism, or having people lose weight is a mechanism, but that's why this study is going to be important because it's going to answer some of those questions. Great. Well, have a good day, everybody. Thank you.